And now our final speaker is Dr. Seth Berkeley, who is CEO of the Gavi Alliance. He was previously the founder, president, and CEO of the International AIDS Vaccine Initiative. And he is going to speak to us about how vaccines for girls deliver health for women. He will speak to us for 10 minutes. Dr. Berkeley. Thank you, and I'm delighted to be here with you at Women Deliver. Now, most of the talks you've heard here today have been about girls and women living in the developing world, and of course, I will come back to that. But I want to start on a more personal level. This is my daughter, and it is an incredible privilege for me to watch her grow up into a healthy, empowered woman. But she has all of the things going for her. She was delivered in a hospital. She got every vaccine, and I guarantee you every vaccine. She was able to go to school, preschool, school, and she will have the opportunity to choose when and if she has a family. And if she does, of course, she's going to be likely to have a safe pregnancy, and she'll also choose when she is able to have a job. But unfortunately, one of the greatest injustices in the world is that it really depends upon where you live, because for many of the women in the world, they do not have the same access as my daughter does. And so that's why I'm here to talk to you today as the CEO of the Gavi Alliance, because we believe that women and men everywhere in the world should have access to these amazing life-saving technologies. The 73 poorest countries is where we work. Those are countries that have less than $1,550 of income. And what we're trying to do is get these tools to them. We've been able to immunize 180 million girls as part of this program, and this meant, has meant that we've been able to prevent 2.7 million deaths. And this is a really important effort, obviously. But what I want to talk to you today is about some, some specific vaccines. And, and one of the interesting things about vaccines is that they are one of the most equitable delivery mechanisms in public health. Girls and boys get brought for vaccination by their families. And we are actually lucky in that we are serving now 60% of the world's birth cohort. This woman's name is Zina. She's from Mobea in Tanzania. About 18 months ago, she went to a clinic and was diagnosed with a sexually transmitted infection. It turns out she was wrongly diagnosed. She came back 18 months later and had stage 3B cervical cancer. She had to sell her mattress, one of her few possessions, to travel to Dar es Salaam to be treated. She's a widow, she has four children, and her one hope was to get back and spend time with her children and take care of them as much as she could. By the time I finish this talk, five women will have died of cervical cancer. This is a tragedy because this can be prevented and treated. But it's a huge injustice. There today are around 275,000 deaths from cervical cancer. Most are in the developing world. But as you can see from this slide, the numbers of those cancers are going to be increasing in the developing world out of proportion to the developed world unless we do something. There's a triple whammy of people who have cervical cancer. There's higher incidence of HPV in these countries. They are then, because there is not screening, they get seen later, and because there's not treatment, they have a higher mortality rate. So this is really a terrible disease, and today it's actually killing about as many women as are dying in childbirth. And of course, the good news is, is that we're reducing the deaths in childbirth, and the numbers of cervical cancer deaths are going up. As I told you, we've got to stop that. So where are the cervical cancer deaths? You see here on a map the distribution of them. You can see a lot of them in Africa, Asia, some in Latin America. Red is bad in this slide. And what I've superimposed here is where the Gavi countries are from the beginning, and you can see there's a good overlap. But this next slide looks at where the vaccine 
was currently being used. So there are 43 countries that have an HPV vaccine. The HPV vaccine is safe, it's very effective, covers about 70% of the cancers. And you can see in these countries, it's an almost opposite map from where the incidence of disease is. So why are people not getting this vaccine? Well, the first reason is because of the cost. And when the vaccine was new, it was introduced into the developed world at about $130 a dose. Over time, the best public sector price has been down at $13. But of course, this is still seen as expensive. And you may have seen about a month ago that through our market shaping effort, we were able to announce a reduction in price for this vaccine. And what we were able to do is get a cost, an initial cost for the Gavi countries of $4.50. Now, uh, this price will come down with increased volumes and with other manufacturers, and so price should not be the limiting factor. But there is a second factor that plays into this, and that is how do we reach adolescent girls? And Rwanda was the first country to show us that this could be done easily. They were managed to roll out with a donation the vaccine across their country. Earlier this month, we rolled out the first of what will be many demonstration projects. This is an opportunity for countries to learn by doing how to get the vaccine out to adolescents, how to reach out to them. If they choose schools, then it's important for them to figure out how they reach girls that aren't in school. If they do outreach clinics, then how do they reach people living in faraway areas? What they will do is do this over a period of time, evaluate, and then based upon that information, they will go ahead and take it nationwide. Now, it isn't only Kenya. We have eight countries now approved for uh, HPV demonstration, and the demand has been extraordinary. We open up the next application round in September, and we're expecting 12 to 15 more applications. And so we see this moving very rapidly, but the reason it's happening is people in these countries see this disease as a terrible disease. They see people having slow, painful deaths at the height of their um, uh, productivity, in the height of their lives, and so there's huge demand for this. So with this acceleration, we hope to have a million girls vaccinated by 2015, but by 2020, over 30 million girls in 40 countries to be vaccinated. Now, as part of this, we want to make sure this isn't done in isolation, because normally girls are seen as they are as children in clinics, and they're seen when they deliver. But this is another intervention. This is a time to bring other health aspects forward. And so what you're seeing here is in Rwanda, health education going on in this period. But this is an opportunity to bring other interventions across a range of issues to these girls. And we're looking for partners in each country. In the demonstration projects, we've asked countries to put together partnerships that will allow them to take advantage of this, which will increase the cost effectiveness of the effort. Now, let me just mention another vaccine, and this is rubella. Rubella causes congenital rubella syndrome. There's about 110,000 cases a year. It leads to stillbirths, it leads to abortions, it leads to horrible birth defects. Most of the cases, again, are in the developing world because in the developed world, this vaccine has been used for years. So we're in the process of trying to double the impact, not just use rubella, but combine it with measles and get it out. And the plan is to immunize 700 million girls and boys in almost 50 countries by 2020. This should make the epidemic of rubella almost disappear. Now, I've talked about two, girls that, two vaccines that are specific to girls, but what's the real vision? The real vision is that every girl, and of course every boy in the world, should have all 12 vaccines that are recommended by WHO. We have extraordinary vaccines now. We have vaccines against diarrhea and pneumonia, the two largest killers of children, against meningitis, other diseases. We've suggested that this become an indicator in the post-2015 era. And why is that? Because it turns out that this particular measurement isn't done, and today less than 5%, around 3 or 4% in the world, are getting all of these vaccines, and that's something we can do that's better. So, what, at the end of the day, what's the message here? The message is, if we have healthy girls, we will have healthy women. 
And I need your help in doing that. Help us advocate to make sure that we get these tools to everybody who needs them. Let's make sure that where you live is not what defines you ultimately as uh, the tools that you have, and let's make sure that every girl in the world has access to the same tools that my dear Tessa has that will allow her to live up to her full potential. Thank you.